So from very early on, I realized that I can stay in my little room in Tehran and the whole world will come. I'm sorry, this uh, Zoom just um, interfered with uh, my talk. Uh, so I learned that I could be in my small room in Tehran and the whole world will come to me through stories. That was my first experience with stories. And uh, my father and I uh, developed this sort of a relationship whereby we communicated through stories. So for example, even if he was um, mad at me, he usually didn't tell me, oh, you know, why did you do this and that? He would say, you know, there was this guy who um, uh, had this young daughter whom he loved very much, but the daughter, you know, yada, yada, yada. And uh, he would go on to uh, tell me about his grievance. Uh, and uh, so that was one reason why I um, wanted to write this book, which is in letter form, addressing my letters to him because uh, of that specific relationship that I had with him. I mean, I could go on about stories forever, but I don't know how much you, you can take. I can, I can, I can take it for sure. And your father sounds like he was a really incredible man. And well, he was in many ways. Um, I learned later um, uh, how, what a gift he has given me through the stories, because I, I'm not exaggerating. People think that I exaggerate when I say that I survived through books. I survived through reading and, and, and writing. Uh, when I was 13, my parents decided to send me to England to um, uh, have me stand on my own two feet and to learn about other cultures and places. But for me, at that age, leaving everything I loved, including my parents, was very painful. And I learned at that age that... Uh, uh, you know, one day you have a home and you have people around you whom you love and who love you back. And the next day, um, there's no one. You're in a strange land where people don't speak your language, don't know about your background. And um, so that uh, made me think that I needed a portable world where that I could take anywhere I wanted with me. I couldn't take Iran with me to England but I could take the best that Iran had to offer. And that was um, uh, its poetry. So I took with me three books, two of them by our classical poets, Rumi and Hafez, and one by this feminist uh, poet whom I loved even at that age uh, um, called Furugh Farrokhzad. And at nights um, I would read them, I would, get under the uh, blanket, it was very cold. And uh, at that time in England, uh, uh, if you wanted the heater, you had to put shillings in them for the heater to work. And anyway, if you sat, if I sat too close to the heater, it would burn me. If I sat uh, far from it, uh, I would be cold. So I would go under the blanket with a um, uh, hot water bottle. And at that time, I had read this book um, called How to Be an Alien, which was a satire on how to be British. And um, it said that um, continental people have sex life. The British have the hot water bottle. So <laughs> hot water bottle found uh, a, a different meaning uh, uh, for me. Anyway, I would read them. And uh, this way I would bring Iran back to me. And later on, both in England and then in America, the way I made myself at home was through the poets and the writers, through Jane Austen and Auden and um, uh, Melville and Hawthorne and uh, Baldwin and uh, all these uh, amazing writers who became my kith and kin. 
uh, no matter where I lived and uh, how I lived. I love that. And I love that you're emphasizing how not only books allowed you to learn about the cultures and the countries that you were moving to, but they also allowed you to bring home with you. That's beautiful. I love that. So it makes the books make a portable world. Yeah. And that portable world, no one can take away from you, no matter where you go. Yes, I love that. That is beautiful. Okay, so my next question I have for you is you've written and lectured extensively on totalitarian regimes and mindsets, especially in regards to the Islamic Republic of Iran. So I'm wondering, could you describe some of the challenges that you encountered while trying to educate students under a totalitarian regime? Oh, boy, <laughs> that um, takes me back uh, to those days, which were both very dark and uh, uh, almost frightening, but at the same time, very hopeful. And the hope came from those students that I taught over the years. Uh, and the hope that I have for the future of Iran is also uh, because of their, uh, those young people. Now, the first thing that a totalitarian regime does wants to take away, it confiscates your history and identity. Uh, it, it's uh, in order to be able to uh, impose its rule upon you. It has to say that in the past, things were not as you say they were, but as I say they were. And their first targets are those who are different. So the first target of the Islamic Republic was women, minorities, and culture. The first departments they closed, uh, they wanted to close at the universities were the humanities. Ayatollah Khomeini said that universities are more dangerous than bombs. Uh, that um, humanities are, is like a poison that is brought from the West to poison the minds of our youth. And uh, humanity since then has been under attack. And if it has not um, been destroyed, it's because the Iranian people resisted it. So the first law that they changed was the family protection law that gave protection to women at home and at work. Iran had very progressive laws before uh, the revolution. Uh, we had two ministers for women, minister for um, um, higher education and minister for women's affairs, something that US still doesn't have. And, and my own mother was one of the first women who went to parliament, to the Iranian parliament in 1963. Um, so Iranian women were active in all walks of life. We had policemen, pilots, people, uh, women in heavy industry, as well as teachers and doctors and, um, and ministers. Uh, so um, what they did, the first thing they did, they attacked women. They changed the laws regarding women. For example, they lowered the age of marriage for females from 18 to 9. Now, those who say that this is their culture and they have a choice, what choice does a nine-year-old girl have uh, that when she's being given away or even sold by her father? They implemented something that I'm told never existed in Iran, which was um, um, stoning people to death for uh, what they called prostitute, prostitution and adultery. They brought polygamy and temporary marriages uh, uh, where a man could marry as many women as he wanted. He could rent a woman, you know, from five minutes to 99 years. Uh, in courtrooms, women, were counted as half the worth of men. If a man killed a woman, the woman's family had to pay half the blood money in order to have him punished to the man. So, you know, you can imagine the shock 
uh, for uh, a population that had lived, um, uh, you know, so freely until that moment. And so there was quite a lot of resistance. The first time Ayatollah Khomeini gave a fatwa making the veil um, uh, mandatory, uh, hundreds of thousands of Iranian women came into the streets in protest and their slogans were freedom is neither Eastern nor Western, freedom is global. And the uh, vigilantes from the regime side would throw acid into the faces of them and uh, attack them with uh, knives and with scissors. Uh, but uh, the Ayatollah had to uh, withdraw his fatwa because of the uh, protests. But then uh, two, or two years later, or maybe less, they made it a law. So when you went to work, uh, you had to wear the veil, otherwise you would be fired. And actually I went and I was fired for refusing to wear the mandatory veil. Um, now the issue of the veil was not the issue of religion. Religion was confiscated by this regime and used as an instrument of power. Uh, my grandmother was an Orthodox Muslim and she would cry and say, this is not the real Islam they should not flog women because women who did not wear the veil, they would be flogged with 86 lashes and jailed. Uh, and she would cry and say that veil should be voluntary. Whoever feels that this is, her, this is the way she wants to express herself, she should wear it, but not everybody who you know, should be forced to wear the veil. Uh, yet they made, they made it mandatory and Iranian women resisted through to this day as we speak, they refused to wear their veils properly. And then the move, a movement came about where uh, Iranian women would take off their veil and take pictures with it and put it on the web. And then veiled women would take their pictures with unveiled women. And men in solidarity with women would put on the veil, there are pictures of it on the internet, they put on the veil and women would take off the veil. So the regime doesn't know what to do with the people because you can put political uh, elements or groups or organizations in jail and murder them and destroy them. But what are you gonna do with millions of people who refuse to do as you tell them to do? So today, when you go into the streets of Iran, you see that women are, have turned the veil on its head. They have made it into something beautiful. Women are not supposed to sing. You're not supposed to dance in Iran. In uh, the video I was going to show you was the Iranian women in defiance on the regime in Tehran Metro had taken off their veils and were dancing. They knew that they would be arrested, but they still would not uh, refrain from that resistance. Uh, so that so you can see why I felt both. Uh, I said both those were the darkest days of my life, as well as the most ho hopeful, um, because of the resistance of Iranian people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you describe the how how the regime it, it was a corruption, like you said, that they corrupted the religious practices and they corrupted the education system, and it was a true corruption. And I love how you describe the defiance, the collective defiance against that. Yeah, there, uh, like for example, movies, especially foreign films, were forbidden. And everybody in their home was watching forbidden videos that they got in black market. Um, my children had seen Marx Brothers while we were in Iran. Um, everybody would listen to forbidden cassettes and everybody would read the forbidden books. That is how people stood up to the regime. Uh, and, and of course they had their own uh, 
background, uh, their own history, which was a history of that was joyous and, and beautiful. Like, for example, Iranian New Year um, is celebrated in 21st of March, which is the first day of spring. And um, the regime tried to say, and it belonged to Zoroastrianism, which was the religion Iran, ancient Iran, uh, believed in uh, for the, uh, nearly 2,000 years before the invasion by Islam, uh, by, uh, by the Arabs. Um, and uh, this regime did their best to um, tell people that this is a, 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 the ritual of the infidels and we can't have it in Iran. But people would celebrate the new year far more than celebrated it before. And they would come into the streets and there would be singing and dancing and you know um, everything to stand up to this regime and say, you have not won. You don't own us, you know. I love that. That's beautiful. Uh, my next question kind of continues in the education vein. In an interview with the Aspen Institute in 2017, you said, today in America, we are segregating science and literature. So why is the separation between science and literature dangerous? And what can we do to repair that connection between science and literature? You know, Janelle, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, be, because uh, I so much resented um, uh, even our officials. I mean, when they would talk about science and technology and that everyone should pursue them at the expense of humanities and arts. Now, why should we um, uh, teach one at the expense of the other? You know, both science and literature are based on two very important human traits. And that is why so many scientists, and uh, the first name that comes to my mind is Einstein, um, were in love with imagination. Einstein was in love with music, and he said that um, imagination is even more potent than science because imagination goes around the world. Or Steve Jobs, uh, you know, he dropped out of school and uh, audited the most useless course in, on campus because they say humanities and arts are useless, which was calligraphy, which then uh, he, the Apple logo comes from uh, his uh, playing with the calligraphy. Art and literature are not useless. Art and literature uh, share with science two very important human traits. One is curiosity. And uh, I always remember uh, Vladimir Nabokov saying curiosity is in subordination in its purest form. Because, you know, when you are curious, you want to go out of yourself and join the world. You want to discover. Um, nowadays, we don't like to discover new things. We stick to old formulas. We have a formula for everything. You have to do this. You have to be like that. Rather than going through the process of finding out. Now, science finds out about nature. And it is not prejudiced if, if their scientific theories become um, are wrong, um, they move on to what is not wrong, you know, or uh, to an, an, another theory. You look at physics uh, with Newtonian physics and then uh, theory relativity and the quantum physics. So they're constantly changing and change is not bad. It is something good. Now, what literature and arts, what humanities are all about is curiosity about human nature. They try to delve into the psyche of human beings and from the old mythologies to the present stories 
have been a way of coping with the world, of trying to find about the world and uh, to come out of yourself. Literature is always about the other. We keep talking about diversity, but then when it comes to literature, uh, we become very narrow as if every person should only talk about herself, should only write about herself, should only read about herself. Well, we need to talk and read and write about ourselves. I mean, uh, that I think we have to uh, uh, encourage more diversity so that more people can write and talk and uh, be part of the larger community. But at the same time, it is so bloody boring to constantly think about just you. It is important to become so that you will connect to others. And, that, and here we come to the second trait that is so important, and that's empathy. You see today, how empathy, how important empathy becomes uh, with the war in Ukraine, uh, with um, uh, Donald Trump in the US, uh, uh, with us being so polarized that we call one another enemies of the people, you know, within such an atmosphere, uh, it is more and more important to connect, to be empathetic. And uh, where do you find empathy? Fiction. The structure of fiction is based on a democratic structure because everyone, their diverse characters who each have to speak, the writer gives each of them their voice, goes under their skin. Even the villain gets the right to speak. It is that generous and that sure of itself that allows the villain to speak. It's not afraid that if the villain speaks, um, her world will be shattered. Uh, so uh, I find it terrible. Science and literature goes together. They complement one another. One is bereft without the other. I wholeheartedly agree. Oh. I wholeheartedly agree, and I absolutely love that response, and I hope that we can move that direction, continue to move that direction in public education, higher education, all those things. I want to transition to focusing on your latest book, which I have read and is quite brilliant. So in Read Dangerously, you discuss the treasured works of Toni Morrison and James Baldwin and Ray Bradbury, all of these authors that mean so much to you. And then you talk about Margaret Atwood. You say, I am sure I am not wrong in thinking that one of the main questions at the heart of both The Handmaid's Tale and The Testaments is the dehumanization and obliteration of those who oppose you or are different from you. I have talked to you in a previous letter about dehumanization of the enemy during wars, but in a totalitarian society, the war is against one's own citizens who are divided into insiders if they obey and outsiders if they don't. And you just touched on that, the polarization that we're experiencing in the United States and the dehumanization. And so I'd love for you to speak on how we can begin to heal and how literature can help us return to a place of empathy and connection, like how, how do we go about that as a nation? Where does That's, it? That is why we need to communicate. I mean, on campuses, universities are the place of knowledge. That is where everything, everything is allowed. You can speak your mind and, and you need to, in order to understand yourself, you need to be in a conversation with others. And I think in universities, we should really stand up and refuse um, this sort of polarization. I think we need to have um, uh, talks within campuses, discourse within campuses, between camps that are um, opposed to one another, you know. And, and I think we need subversive book groups everywhere especially in schools and universities where we read the banned books 
in order to find out what is the whole, whole what is the what is it all about you know um, we read them ourselves and we discuss among ourselves i think that this is the time when the young people and the universities would could play a very very important role and um, if they don't it is shunning their responsibility um, uh, we keep talking about others, but prove that you are dedicated to the freedom of those others that you're talking about, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I'm hopeful because I see uh, movement among young people, and I hope that um, uh, they will not commit the same mistakes that my generation did. Um, where now we can't even speak to one another. Hmm. Well, that that is a that is a really really powerful call to action, and I hope that our our college will take it seriously. So, well, I'm sure it will. <laughs> I hope so. I'm sure it already has. <laughs> so, my next question also has to do with your book. Um, you write, my experience of coming from an oppressed society where the regime considered writers poets and artists as its enemies, where so many of them had been jailed, tortured, and even killed, was confirmation of how pivotal, pivotal imagination is to freedom. So my question, who are some up and coming artists, writers, or poets that you're watching right now as sources of imagination and subversion? Oh my God. <laughs> I, uh, I always say that when it comes to books, I become very promiscuous and um, I just go to all, all sorts of different places. Like uh, um, I'm thinking about one book, uh, Ayad Akhtar, writing about uh, a sort of a biographical novel. Uh, one person that I really love um, is the Czech-born artist and illustrator and storyteller, uh, Peter Sis. Uh, he just um, uh, uh, wrote a book about, um, uh, which is based on the true story of this um, uh, man who during the Holocaust, uh, during the fascist times uh, uh, rescued young children uh, from, uh, from the Holocaust. Um, uh, I'm reading a book of poetry, um, which is a thousand years of Persian poetry but it's translated into English, actually. A thousand years of Persian poetry by women. I mean, you read poetry that goes back to a thousand years and you see these women are as modern as you and I. They are so vital, so alive, so beautiful uh, in their poetry. Um, you, you want to know Iran, you go to its poetry. Um, and um, uh, there is a book by um, one of my favorite writers, Anne Applebaum, uh, called The Twilight of Democracy. Um, I'm, I, it's really a shame that we have to think about that as well, but um, that is another book that uh, I, uh, I like. You've given us a lot of ideas, I think. I'm sure a lot of us were writing down everything. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Oh, by the way, the book by Peter Sis, I didn't give the name. It is Nikki and Vera. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So looking towards the future, what projects are you working on now that you're excited about? Right now, I'm still um, stuck with this new baby. Uh, <laughs> I always think that the process of writing is like um, uh, having a child. Uh, you go through so much um, 
anticipation and anxiety, what will happen? Will he come to the world uh, in one piece? <laughs> will, uh, have I done everything right to bring him to, into this world? And once the baby is born, um, uh, she or he goes into amazing places you've never dreamt of and brings people to your home that you never knew. So, um, I'm busy with this baby trying to uh, teach her to walk and talk. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, there are two uh, dif very different uh, uh, projects that I have been thinking about. Um, one is um, mystery. I love to write about mystery tales and about the kind of morality behind uh, mystery stories. And the other one um, is uh, maybe something about Iran. Uh, I felt that, um, I feel that people uh, generalize too much and uh, they don't know the other side of Iran, the, uh, the silenced one. Uh, it is not silence inside Iran, but it is silenced here. Uh, and um, I was thinking of writing about the Iranian women and uh, their resistance. Uh, but these are just ideas. I, I, they might go nowhere. I've had so many ideas for a book that I then it never turned into a book. That's okay. Our ideas percolate that way and then we go in a different direction and that's okay. But those sound like really, really incredible projects. Mm -hmm. And regarding your writing, I'm really curious about what your writing process looks like. So as you were working on this book, what was your day-to-day -day routine? Well, this book was different uh, from others because part of it I was writing during the pandemic. Uh, before this book, I had the habit of writing in my office, but also uh, going to coffee shops uh, and, and sometimes to coffee shops that um, um, uh, were, belong to museums like the National Gallery or uh, Phillips Museum. I would go there and write and go and watch my favorite painting and then come and write. But during the pandemic, um, I couldn't do that. Uh, no coffee shops, no museums. Um, so I would drink loads of coffee and wake up very early, go outside um, to the balcony, salute the river and um, uh, come, up, come inside and uh, write. But of course, uh, I, I go nuts when I write. So I walk around like a crazy person, sometimes put some brandy in my coffee to feel better, you know. <laughs> Um, uh, so I somehow, uh, as if I wanted to escape into a cocoon, uh, I wrote part of this book in my bedroom. My bedroom is now filled with books. Uh, the walls are filled. I mean, I just took the books that I wanted to work on with, in this book and took it to my bedroom and I would sit on the bed and, and, and write. Uh, so, um, but recently I've not come out of my bedroom. <laughs> That's beautiful. And it sounds like you needed that, you needed maybe that more intimate space because you were, you were writing letters to someone who you loved, someone yeah. your father. So that makes perfect sense to me. Thank you. You give it sense <laughs> the way you describe it. <laughs> Thank you. So I just have one more question and then we'll, we'll field some questions from the audience. Um, my last question is, what brings you hope today? You know, um, I mention it in, in my book as well. There's this quotation from Václav Havel, uh, the former president of Czech, but before that he was uh, one of the great activists and playwrights. Uh, uh, not just uh, for Czechoslovakia, but for the whole world. He talks about hope and he says, 
Hope is not optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that it makes sense no matter how it turns out. So I always think as long as we're doing the right thing, not because we will be rewarded for it, but because it means something, because it is the thing to do, because it makes sense, then there's hope. So that is how I have hope. And uh, I have a lot of hope uh, uh, for uh, the youth in Iran and in this country. So we'll see. I do too. <laughs> I do too. Thank you. That gives me, yeah, I'm going to be thinking about that quote for a long time. <laughs> I just have to mull it over. Okay. So we have a few questions from the audience. We got a question through our email. Uh, what advice do you have for young people who want to be writers? First of all, don't listen to anyone's advice. That is to begin with. But for me, um, you need to have real passion. It is like deciding to have a baby or falling in love. Uh, you have to be wholly committed and conditionally committed and not let the outside world tell you otherwise. If you are a writer, you know you are a writer and uh, uh, you will be committed no matter how many times one would be rejected uh, or one has doubts. Uh, um, it is the hardest thing in the world, one of the hardest and one of the best rewarded things in the world. Mm -hmm. Because you discover the world and you discover yourself. Wow. You're so inspiring. Sorry. I wish. <laughs> I, could listen, I could listen to you all day. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, don't let anybody tell you different. That's <laughs> okay. And we had a message through YouTube, it looks like. Um, someone said, seems like you have been to England, Iran, US, Portugal. Um, what challenges of English knowledge can you clarify? What challenges of English knowledge? Yeah. I don't understand. English knowledge. I always think of knowledge as universal. Um, it might, uh, we might, uh, first of all, knowledge of what? I mean, there's so many, uh, and uh, different parts of the world, each part of the world you think has offered a different kind of knowledge to us. Um, so I don't quite understand English knowledge. I'm not, I'm not quite, I wish I could, I wish I could ask this person directly <laughs> for clarification, but um, yeah, what challenges of English knowledge can you clarify? Hmm, I'm not sure. And yeah, I'm not sure if, like you said, I'm not sure if knowledge is, is particular to language. Um, I don't know. Because you do, you speak multiple languages, clearly. <laughs> no, not really. Just who well and, uh, and one sort of. <laughs> yeah. What, what language do you write your rough drafts in? Like as you're composing? All, all my uh, drafts are in English. Okay, very cool. I love playing with Persian and English sometimes, bringing into, bringing into English my Persian, the mm -hmm. nuances, but I write in English. Do you feel like like each language has has something different to offer? Is there a lot of overlap or do you feel like sometimes you can say something in Persian that you can't find the words for in English? That, that one. Uh, there are, <laughs> sometimes I cannot find uh, the, and, and in trying to find the equivalent in Persians, in, in English, something new comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so one, one good thing about being an, an immigrant is that you look at the world through the alternative eyes of the other culture, mm. you know, and uh, that is true of language. Of course, some people are not, not me, but some people are geniuses at it, like Nabokov. I mean, what he did with his Russian and English is uh, 
amazing, you know, mm -hmm. that, but, um, but I enjoy playing the, with the two languages. I feel like languages are meant to be played with. Yes, you're and right. Especially for writers, like, yeah, I love that. Okay, well, we have another question through email. And that question is, why did you structure your book as letters to your father? Wow, that is, um, that was, I try to be brief. Um, uh, I was, you, you know, we lived in uh, the time that I mentioned in my book that I was writing it. Um, those were very weird times. <laughs> they were strange times. And I couldn't write straight essays about them. Um, uh, it would become more formal and less intimate. And I always like to bring narrative examples in my work. I don't, um, I love this interplay between reality and fiction, how you talk about fiction and mix it with the narrative of the time, at the time of writing or thinking about that work of fiction. Uh, so I wanted something more intimate. And um, I, just going crazy at that time with what was happening in this country and around the world, um, I started writing at first random letters um, to my father, actually, uh, to James Baldwin, to Donald Trump, uh, to <laughs> all sorts of people, like Saul Bellows Herzog, I was just writing letters. But those letters were too random, and I couldn't um, use them in, a, in, a, in the book. Um, so then I decided I will write to the writers whose books I'm using. But um, that also became too artificial uh, because I didn't know these writers uh, intimately. Uh, so I, why, why, what would I say in the letter? Would I talk to them about their own books? Um, that was crazy. They knew about their own books. They didn't need me to write them a letter uh, about it. So I was talking to a friend and she said, why don't you use a third person? And the first thing that came to my mind was my father. Um, he wrote to me before I could write and read. I was about four years old and, and I have the diary here. In his diary, he addresses me for the time when I can read and know about um, how he felt at the time, what plans he had for his future and what impact my, I had on his life. Uh, so my letter writing with my father goes back to a long, long time ago. And I wrote to him when I was six and he was in United States studying. And I would write him on scraps uh, of paper and he would write me long letters. Of course, I had just learned how to write. Uh, so I decided to write about to him. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I love thinking about, yeah, the little six-year-old you writing something to your father. That's, that's really wonderful. And it makes complete sense for this book. And you're right that it was, it felt very intimate. Like it felt of like a very intimate conversation that you were having. Um, but it was, it was wonderful. So all audience members go pick, go pick up, read dangerously because it's amazing. And Azar, that is all the questions that we have for you. Thank um, you, Janelle, and thank you, the Spokane College, for this wonderful conversation you created. Well, thank you so much for visiting with us, and we've we've learned a lot. I will definitely be revisiting this conversation and writing down all, all sorts of things. So thank you for spending your evening. You. <laughs> Bye, Azar. Bye.